Brandon does such a good job leading our singing, and especially because he was trying to lose his voice. You may not have known that. But I'll tell you what, he just messed up big time because he missed a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. How could we not sing just, if just a cup of water as he was handed that cup to drink? I mean, that's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It'll never happen again. You have no idea how honored we are that you're here tonight. We love to have other congregations in our building. We love the Church of Christ. We love the Brotherhood. We love our sister congregations. And so it really means the world to us that you're here tonight and that your congregation is represented for this, for this great night. Have you ever been in love? Now, some of y'all aren't there yet, but some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And I'm not talking like you walked in and you saw a cute boy or girl tonight and you're in love. No, I'm talking about the real thing. Like, you're at work and you're at school, but it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. You can't wait to get off, can't wait to get out of school, to race home and to see that person and to talk to them. Like you're in sports or you're in band, but it doesn't matter because you can't wait till it's over until you can get out and you can see them and you can talk to them. You used to stay up all night reading or playing video games, but now you stay up all night talking and texting on the phone, that kind of love. You know, when I was first falling in love with my wife, Ashley, seeing her was the only thing that I wanted to do. Now, I lived in... Jacksonville, Alabama, which is about an hour from here, and she lived here in Rome. And every Friday, as soon as I got off work, I would race to Rome to see her. Now, we only dated about six months before we got married, but for that six months, the only thing I wanted to do was to be around her. And so I would get here as soon as I could, and I even had a friend that would let me stay on his couch each night, and I wouldn't leave Rome until I had to leave for work Monday morning at 8 a.m. And so I spent all of the time that I could trying to be around her and trying to be with her. And it wasn't enough, no matter how much time I spent. You know, I had a lot of hobbies. I had a lot of friends. But none of those things were as important to me anymore once I met Ashley and once I could start spending time with her. And so all of how I spent my time changed. You know, some of you would rather see the other person that you like right now or that you love than breathe. You know, and that, that's when it gets dangerous. But we all have those people or will have those people that just change everything for us. You know, if you've never been there, it seems silly. But one day, you'll understand. And so I spent my time chasing her, showing her what she meant to me. You know, I was after her heart. I wanted to win her over. I wanted to make her love me and to like me and to spend the rest of her life with me. You know, I'm telling you all of this. Because this earthly example is the closest thing that I can think of to, to convey to you a much deeper spiritual reality that we have. It's the only thing I can think of to show something this deeply spiritual. But what does it look like to be after God's heart? What does it look like to, to chase God with everything that you've got? What does it look like when we care about His ways more than anything else that we've got, more than anything else in our life? That's the kind of relationship that I want to have with God. Nothing else matters as much as God, and I want that kind of relationship with God even more than I want that relationship with my wife. And that's the kind of relationship we read about when we read about a man named David. And if you want to open up, we'll spend all of our time tonight in 1 Samuel, and we'll start in chapter 13, so you can be opening up there. But David felt this way about God. And David was a man after God's own heart. And what that means after God's own heart really means that David was God's man. David had, chosen, had been chosen by God, had been put in place on purpose and with a purpose and with a plan. He was God's man. You know, Saul was king before David. That was the people's king. Saul was a king after the people's heart. But God said, now this time I'm going to put David in place because David is a man after my heart. He's a king of my choosing. And so God put David in. Well, what was so special about David? What does it look like to be after God's heart? And as you open up to 1 Samuel chapter 13, just a little bit of background information. There was a time when God was the king of the Israelites. That is, there was no earthly king. Much like today, if you asked us, someone outside the religious world may say, hey, who's the leader of the church of Christ? They may say, where are your headquarters? And we would, knowing what they mean, just say to them simply, well, we don't have headquarters on earth. And we don't have an earthly leader. And they may think we're being smart, Alec, but that's just the reality of the matter. Our headquarters are in heaven, and Jesus is our king and our leader and our Lord, and that's it. 
And so much like that, God was at one time the leader, the king for the Israelite people. But you know what they did? They looked around them at the nations around them, and they said, every single nation around us has a king, an earthly king. We want a king like that. And God said, no, you don't. If you get a king like that, he's going to turn his heart from God. He's going to turn the people's heart from God. He's going to lead you into slavery, into more damage than you can possibly imagine. And they said, we don't care. We want an earthly king anyway. And so God gave them a king, and Saul is that first king. And so when we pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 13, this is going to be a conversation between Samuel, who is the prophet of God, the mouthpiece of God, who tells the king and the people what God wants, a conversation between him and this first earthly king, Saul. So 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. And this is the first time we see any mention of David. We aren't told his name, but we're told about him, what kind of person he is. Verse 13, And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. And here's David. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. You flip a couple chapters later, in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 28, Samuel is talking to Saul again about this same King David, and he said, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and he's given it to, here's David, a neighbor of yours who is better than you. So Samuel says, Oh, Saul, you've messed up. God set you as king. He would have established you as king forever. People would have been reading about you in history books throughout the course of the world. Jesus would have come through your line. You would have had a kingdom that would have never gone away. No man could take it away. But you messed it up. You turned your heart from God, and now God has taken the kingdom away from you. And he tells him, without mentioning David's name, I'm going to select my guy. I'm putting my guy in place because he's a man that's better than you. He has me in his sights and in his heart. Now turn over to 1 Samuel 16, and then we'll just kind of march through the text, chapter 16 and 17. This is the first time we actually meet David, and he's called by name. In chapter 16, in the start of it, Samuel is so upset about what's happened to Saul that he has retired from public ministry, as it were. And he is moping and whining and weeping and mourning the loss of this man of God. God's anointed is no longer king. And so he loved Saul and he loved God's plan and he was upset about it. And so he's retired. He's teaching more privately, teaching prophets, but he's not speaking out in this public way. But God calls him out of retirement to come back and to anoint David as king. So look at verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. So I don't think God has any problem with Samuel mourning this changing of the guard, the loss of his friend in this sense. But God says, How long are you going to do it? basically says, get up, get over it, we've got work to do. And he says, I'm going to send you to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse, and one of his sons is going to be king in Saul's place. So Samuel goes to Bethlehem to look at the sons of Jesse and to find the next king. And Jesse parades his sons, one, or the, one after the other, in front of Samuel to see who will be king. When God chose a king for the people, you remember that king, Saul, or Saul became a king after the people's heart. He chose an attractive man, a man that the Bible says was head and shoulders above the rest, someone that was physically impressive. But when God chose a king after his own heart, he chose someone that was impressive internally, that had the right kind of mind, the right kind of heart. He didn't base it on the outward. You think Samuel would have learned his lesson. God picked this man who's attractive and powerful and tall, and look what he did. But Samuel didn't learn his lesson. So he assumed it would be Jesse's oldest, most physically impressive son, Eliab, in verse 6. Let's read verses 6 and 7. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Now, how beautiful is that? God judges not based on what hand we were dealt genetically, or in life, God's not basing on the outward appearances, but God bases on what we can control, what's internal. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4, Paul is talking to our sisters, to the Christian ladies, and he's telling them how to prioritize how they look in their life. And he tells them there, he says, your beauty, it should be that of your inner self, 
the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. You know, this is specifically to the women. We could apply it to the men as well. If we spend two hours getting our hair ready, picking out the right outfit, and then in a day we don't spend two minutes thinking about how we are in here, how we are here, how we view people, how we interact with people, what our purpose in life is, God says you have your priorities out of order. We should spend more time changing the inward person, which is what God judges and what God looks out, than the outward. And you know, we can be beautiful on the outside, but not be beautiful to God. And so that's where the focus should be. So if it were up to Jesse in 1 Samuel 16 here, and if it were up to Samuel, the new king would be Eliab. He's the first one Jesse offered. He's the first one Samuel thought, well, this has got to be the guy. Look at how kingly he looks. But it wasn't up to Jesse, and it wasn't up to Samuel. It was up to God, and so Eliab was rejected. Now, in verses 8 through 11, the sons of Jesse, they're going to be presented one after the other to Samuel to see who's going to be king. Let's read verses 8 through 11. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammai pass. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, Well, there remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him. We won't even sit down until he comes. Okay, so it seems like at some point in this process, Samuel, God's mouthpiece, the prophet, fills Jesse in on what's going on. I'm here because one of your sons is going to be the next king of Israel. And so Jesse brings in his sons and he lines them up in an order of most likely to least likely, maybe oldest to youngest possibly, and he presents them to Samuel. And so Samuel sees them and sees this recommendation from Jesse and he says, you think that's the king, but, but that's not the king. God has rejected him. God is going to pick someone else. And so he tells him, no, 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 time after time, seven times. And it's not until he tells him no on this last and seventh son that he's brought that Jesse realizes, oh, hey, there's someone else that I didn't bring. I didn't even think enough, maybe, of my youngest son to invite him to allow him to have a chance. And so now they send for him, and they bring David. You know, to me that says that Jesse thought David was the least likely candidate, and there was no need to even send for him. So Samuel tells Jesse, one of your sons is going to be the next, next king, Jesse doesn't think enough of him to even invite him to the meeting. But it's David because God sees something special in him. There were a lot of people God could have chosen. You know, I'm sure there were more athletic people. There were better warriors. There may have been better looking people in the kingdom. But God chose David because there was something special about him. You know, it's interesting. He wasn't invited to this meeting. And now they're waiting on him. And he is leaving watching his father's sheep to start watching the father's sheep. Look at verses 12 through 14. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord at the same time departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. So Saul's life gets really bad. You know, when God leaves us or when we leave God, things get bad. And David's life gets really good. When we're walking with God, our life gets good. All right, now this will be our biggest chunk that we'll read. Read with me verses 14 through 23. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you'll be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide me a man who can play well and bring him to me. And one of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Verse 19, Therefore Saul sent to Jesse and said, Send me David your son who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David his son to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, 
and the harmful spirit departed from him. So Saul's life gets really bad. David's life gets really good. So good that even though David keeps his mouth shut, he doesn't tell anyone that he was king, everyone around him still notices him. You know, if we were to wait here till midnight and we were to wait till it's really dark out, we turned all the lights off, and then one person in the middle of the auditorium were to turn a flashlight on, all of our eyes would instantly be drawn there. So it is when you add a Christian to a dark situation. They get a lot of attention. They get a lot of focus because people see Christ living through them and it shines in the darkness. And so it was here with David. People could tell that David had been with God. Something was different about him. He'd been anointed king, but just like he was instructed, he hadn't told anyone. You know, could you keep a secret like that? I mean, we're so quick to post every great thing that we do, uh, even take credit maybe for other people's great things that could involve us. But David kept a, a secret that was so special. He kept it so well that even in chapter 17, our next chapter, his older brother Eliab didn't know that he had been anointed king. And so here Saul had been told his neighbor would take his place, and now unknowingly Saul has invited that neighbor David in. So in Saul's court, in the palace, God has set up David to be Saul's physician. And now in chapter 17, God is about to set David up to be Israel's champion. Look at chapter 17. The Israelites had been destroying the Philistines. I mean, it really wasn't a fair fight because God was on their side. But Saul had made some poor choices, and he kind of left the door open for the Philistines to come back in. And there were some clearly defined borders of where the Jews' land was, where the Israelites were. And the Philistines saw a weakness in Saul. Maybe they thought, well, Samuel has retired. Maybe God has retired from helping this people. They saw the evil spirit maybe that was tormenting Saul and thought, his mind is not on war. This would be a good time for us to strike. And so they go into part of this border territory that Israel owned and they set up camp, basically challenging the Israelites to come and to kick them out. So that's where we find ourselves in verses 1 through 11. They wanted to take this opportunity to get back to their enemy, to end on a win instead of a loss, to repair their hurt pride. Now when the Philistines, verse 17... I'm sorry, chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. Verse 3, And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So anywhere from nine and a half feet to eleven feet tall. Verse 8, He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for a battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you are servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself, and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed, they were stressed out, they were greatly afraid. So the Philistines say, you send one of your best warriors. Let's, let's not waste time. Let's not waste so many lives. You send one of your best warriors. We'll send our best warrior, this Goliath, and we'll let the two of them fight. And whoever wins, they win the battle. And the other army will surrender and be their servants forever. Goliath was an estimated nine and a half to 11 feet tall. And if that wasn't intimidating enough, they put on armor on him to make him even scarier. And so he walked into the valley between the armies with a voice probably as strong as his arms and he bellowed out and he made fun of God and he challenged God's people. Goliath's heart was full of pride. In verse 11, Saul heard it. And what did he do? Say, hey, this is the God that created everything. He can take care of this. No, Saul was afraid. When a leader gets afraid, their people usually do too. And so Israel followed Saul's bad example. So the two armies, they faced each other for 40 days across this valley. Every morning and every night, Goliath would come out, go into the valley below, and bellow out insults to God and to God's people, challenging them to fight. Goliath grew braver every day, and God's people grew more afraid by the day. And David is at home at this time. It's estimated that he may have been right around 20 years old, and that's usually the age that you went to war, so maybe a little younger. So David's not there, but he's at home growing closer to God. And so David's dad 
actually sends David to the battle to check on his brothers, to see if they're running low on food, to see if they need help, and to bring back word of what's going on. Now, I think it says a lot about David that he didn't ask to go. He didn't sneak off to go to get into the middle of it. He didn't go looking for adventure, but he just obeys his father and he goes. Now, look at verse 20. Look at David's work ethic. It says he got up early and he left the sheep with a substitute keeper. You know, Jesus once said that if we are faithful in little things, that we can be trusted with more. You know, it matters if you try at work. It really does. Your boss may not care. It may not affect your pay. But it matters if you try at work. It matters if you try at school. It matters if you obey your parents. God does not give big jobs to people that can't handle little jobs. And so here David is showing off his work ethic. He has somewhere important to be. He's been anointed king, but he still gets up early and he still makes sure the job is done before he leaves. Then David walks what we know to be about 15 miles. And when David shows up at the battle, this is not like the previous 40 days. The previous 40 days were this call and response, this all show. When David shows up at the battle, things have intensified and they're about to fight each other. And one last time, Goliath goes out gets in the middle of the valley and yells one last time, maybe one last dose of pride for himself, makes fun of God and challenges God's people. Now David gets here. Look at the timing from God to send David at this exact time. David shows up and he hears Goliath and he says, who is this guy? What's he saying? Why has no one stood up to him and taken care of this? You know what happens with his older brother, Eliab? He's jealous, maybe afraid of David outshining him. So he makes some false accusations to David. He says, what are you doing here? Does dad even know you're here? Who's washing the sheep? I know you. I know your character. You just came to see a show and to see something. You know, my kids will sometimes come and tattle to me. They'll say, daddy, daddy, so-and-so so called me a fill-in-the-blank, whatever it is. And I'll say to them, okay, are you a fill-in-the-blank? And they'll say, well, no. I'll say, okay, well, what if they call you a car? What if they call you a cat? What if they call you an inanimate object? Are you any of those things? Well, no. Okay, don't let what people say affect who you know you are. You can't control what everyone says to you in life. The only thing you can control is how you react to that. And so that's exactly what David does in this situation. He doesn't get into a shouting match or an argument or attack his brother back. He doesn't lose his cool. He answered with the truth, and he moved on. He's there for concern for his family and for God, and that's it, and he knows it. You know, that's all you can do. James says that our anger does not work the works of God, the righteousness of God. If we lose our cool, if we lose control, if we say mean things to people, we're not doing God any favors. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1, the Bible says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So David, here David is living this proverb out before his son ever wrote it. So Saul hears what David has said, that he wants to fight Goliath, and so Saul calls David in. Notice how David says in verse 31, he's talking to Saul here, and he's trying to convince him to let David go to the battle. He says, let no man's heart fail. You know, David could have said to Saul, Saul, you are a coward. You're afraid, you're scared, you're an abomination. You're an insult to God, and you shouldn't be leading these people. All of those things would have been true. But is that how David handled the situation? No. He went in a kind and a wise way. You know, you may have an enemy in life. You may have someone you're arguing with, someone that's making things tough on you. But you don't ever, ever have a need to be mean, especially as Christians. You know, we're called not to react to what's done to us, but to act. And so here it is with David. His argument convinces Saul, and Saul says that he can fight Goliath. You know, I think it's interesting when Saul is, when David is in this argument, this discussion with Saul, like, hey, let me go fight Goliath. He doesn't open up any kind of written testament from God. He doesn't even call to mind the oral traditions that have been passed down about all the things that God has done. We already know Saul is a man who really doesn't care that much about what God says. But look at how David convinces him. David says, look, I've killed a bear. I've killed a lion. I didn't do that by myself. God was with me. God made it happen, and God will allow me and help me to kill this giant. And so from that, he gets Saul's permission. 
Saul tries to put his armor on David to protect him, but it doesn't fit David very well, and uh, he's not used to it, so he asks to not have to take it, and so that's what happens. He doesn't wear the armor. You know, I wonder if the irony ever struck Saul that he tried to put the helmet and the armor on a man that would eventually take his crown and robe and take his spot as the king. So it's almost time for this famous combat scene, and these next few verses will get us ready. Look at verse 45. Goliath here is ready with his armor. He's ready with his armor bearer in front of him. He's ready with his sword and his spear. And David only has a sling and five little stones. Goliath curses at David, and he's offended that the Israelites would send out this weak enemy and opponent for him. And so in his last few moments, he insults God again and insults David. But look at David's speech. Does he get baited into this fight? Does he return mean for me? Verse 45, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all the assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. It's already his, and he will give you into our hand. So David said the victory, it wouldn't show how great Israel was. It wouldn't show how great David was. It would show how great God was. You know, it's God that gets the credit when the extraordinary is done with the ordinary. So here it is, the battle, verses 48 through 51. Goliath makes a show. He comes out and taunts David. David runs quickly at him and runs toward Goliath. Goliath wasn't in a hurry because he knew that at any time he could kill David with one swing whenever he wanted. And so he wasn't afraid, but he was cocky. He took his time. But while he was taking his time, David struck first. He threw a stone that went up in the air and with God's guidance, hit the giant between the eyes or in the forehead, and in the twinkling of an eye, the giant hit the ground. See how frail and uncertain life can be? You know, we think we've got everything figured out and everything's going to be a certain way. Things can change instantly. So David took Goliath's sword, took his own sword, how insulting, took his own sword from him and cut off Goliath's head. You know, I'm sure some thought, he's not even taking a sword into battle. Where is he going to get one? He's going to take one from Goliath and use it. And that'll work just fine. So when Goliath died, the Philistines did not surrender like he had promised. But their spirit was broken. And they ran. They retreated. And the Israelites' spirits were lifted. And they pursued the Philistines and chased them out. Now all of Israel had been put on notice. David was known in the courts. And now David was known in the camp. God didn't use Saul. Because Saul didn't have the right kind of heart. He was tall. He was powerful. He was in the right position. He was popular. He was the king, but he wasn't the right kind of man. God used a little shepherd, a nobody in the eyes of his enemies, a nobody in the eyes of a lot of his countrymen, all because David's heart was in the right place. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 says that God is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. You, you dream up something, something amazing, for your life, for God, for the church, whatever it is God can think of and make actually happen greater than we can ever think of. God formed a man after his own heart, a king, a prophet, a relative of Jesus from a boy whose father didn't believe in him. Now, who doesn't believe in you? People may limit you. You may have a time in your life when a teacher says you'll never amount to anything. People that you go to school with may think that you'll never be anything. Your parents, your own family may think you're very limited, that you'll never be anything. And they may tell you from time to time, people will try to limit you. You may even try to limit yourself. But this story, this story shows us that if you'll give your heart to God, your whole heart, if you'll be a person after God's heart, chasing and pursuing God, that there's no limit to what God can do with you. In the 1980s in London, a man sold a fake diamond ring, and he sold it for $13. I think he thought that was pretty good for a fake diamond ring. To him, it was just worthless toy, and he was glad to get $13 from it. And there was a woman who was in the hospital uh, where she bought this ring, and 
things weren't going well for her and she just wanted something that was shiny. And so she knew the ring wasn't real, but she still wanted it. And so she paid $13 for it. And it was so beautiful that she wore it every day. And after 30 years of having it, she thought, well, I'm going to take this to a jeweler just to see what it's worth, so I'll know. And when she took the ring to the jeweler, she was shocked to find out that the ring that she had was real, and it was actually worth $800,000. And that's what it went for at auction when she sold it. You know, someone didn't want it. They thought it was junk. They thought it was a toy to be used and to be played with and then to be discarded but they didn't know the value of what they had. In the right hands, it was worth a fortune. There will be some people in this life that don't want you, that think you are there for them, that think you're junk, that think you're a toy that can be played with and used and thrown away. But God loves you, Jesus died for you, and the church here will make you feel welcome and help you get to heaven. You know, the world, just like this man with this ring, may not see your potential, but in the right hands, you could be worth a fortune. Let me give you a couple of thoughts to think about as we leave tonight. God works through the willing. God works through the obedient. God works through pure hearts. It starts with opening your heart to God. Uh, each congregation in the area is going to host one of these nights, and that's kind of the theme, opening our heart to God. And that's what it starts with. That's what David did as he opened his heart to God by going after God's heart with his whole heart. We wouldn't have picked a shepherd to be a king. We would not have picked a boy to defeat a giant. But God doesn't save like we would. The way God does things don't always make sense to us, but God's ways are always right, and they're always better than our ways. Well, how can God save you? Well, in another surprising way. It's kind of amazing that God's big plan was to leave the comfort of heaven, come as a defenseless child born into less than ideal situations and conditions, to grow up to be a man, to live a perfect life, and then to what? To die? But that was God's plan. That was what God worked out from before the world was ever formed. This wasn't a, a plan that started recently. This wasn't even a plan that started with creation, but a plan that has been around since before there was time. So that's God's plan for us. There's a valley of sin that separates us and God. And Jesus is that bridge in the middle that is the solution for the problem of sin. And God loves us. He wants to take care of that problem. He sent Jesus to do that very thing. But now the choice is up to us. The ball is in our court. To take care of that problem, we have to open our whole heart in obedience. We have to follow after God's will with our whole heart, our complete will. So today... What God asks us to do is slightly different than what God asks people to do in different times. Today, God asks us to repent, which means to change the way we've been living. I mean, we live a selfish life a lot of times, especially those of us that might be outside of Christ. We, we think about ourselves. What can I do to make me happy? What can I do to make my situation better? But God calls us to change that attitude and to think about what can I do to be more pleasing to God and what can I do to help other people? Once we fix this relationship, we start working on the relationships with those that are around us. And so God asks us to change who we've been serving, to change who we've been living for, to live for Him. And then Jesus asks us to also put our old self to death. I mean, isn't that an amazing idea? You've got this God, you, this person who's selfish, who's living for themselves. They're just doing it completely wrong. They're trying to fix it their way and it just won't work. So God says, put that person to death. And the way that we do that is we reenact what Jesus did. You know, Jesus came, lived that perfect life, died, was buried in a tomb, and rose that third day. And so what, God, what does God call us to do? Repent and be baptized. Well, why don't we do that? Well, one of the reasons we do it is to reenact what Jesus has done. Put to death that old person, be buried in water for the forgiveness of our sins, and rise to walk in a newness of life. And if we'll do that, and we'll keep walking in that new life, God has promised that he can and that he will save us. So give your whole heart to God by starting to obey Him today. We will baptize you now. We'll keep studying with you so that you can keep learning. And we will encourage you and help you as you try to get to heaven. We'll help you live up to the full potential that you have that can only be realized with God's help. Open your heart to God. You don't have to know everything, but you know enough tonight after what we've talked about. Open your whole heart to God, get baptized, and start living a life that is for God. If you want to do that, we'll sing a song to encourage you, and you can come, and we'll do that tonight while we sing.